So today we're going to be talking about sepsis and septic shock. And we're going to start by asking the question, what is sepsis? And to be able to answer the question, we need to understand the pathophysiology of sepsis. And to understand the pathophysiology of sepsis, we need to be on the same page in regards to basic physiology concept. And particularly uh, in regards to uh, basic concepts that are related to sepsis and septic shock. So I'd like to start by asking the question, what is blood pressure? And why do we even measure blood pressure? And whenever I ask this question, usually, you know, the common answers I get are that the blood pressure is uh, an indication of the heart function or that, uh, you know, the blood pressure co is correlated to blood flow and it does describe flow. Now, the problem with this is that uh, to be able to correlate the blood pressure to the flow or to the blood flow, then you should be able to answer uh, three more uh, complex questions. So is flow related to blood pressure? Is the relationship linear? So that means that the more you increase the blood pressure, the more you increase the flow. Is that the case? And can you use the blood pressure to describe flow? So uh, the answers to, three, to, to these three questions are not straightforward. And that's why we need to go back to the basic physiology uh, and the basic equation of uh, the blood pressure. And the blood pressure, in this case, the mean blood pressure is given by the cardiac output multiplied by the systemic vascular resistance. So the blood pressure is, is generated by the heart that is pumping blood against a resistance. Um, so if you want to increase the blood pressure, you can either increase the cardiac output or you can increase the systemic vascular resistance, or you can increase both. And if you want to decrease the blood pressure, you can decrease the cardiac output, decrease the resistance, or decrease both. So from here, you can see that, you know, the blood pressure, um, you know, it's, it's not really always an indication of the heart function, uh, because the cardiac output is only one side of the equation. And if you want to have a, 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 a more visual uh, model of it is that uh, you know you're doing something you're measuring force that is sitting between the heart and and the small arteries or the capillaries and the blood pressure uh, then if you if you um, let the equation explode is given by the stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate all multiplied by the systemic vascular resistance. So in this case, uh, we see that the cardiac output is given by the stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate. So from one side, you have the heart, and from the other side, you have the resistance, so the small arteries. And you, by measuring the blood pressure, you're just measuring a force that is generated uh, in between these two uh, entities. And talking about flow, uh, you know, if you go back to basic physics again, uh, the linear flow in a tube um, it, uh, has uh, an equation that is uh, that puts in correlation the pressure and the flow. In this case, the pressure there is the delta p, and and uh, the flow is the q. But you can see from here that the relationship is not linear at all. There are many factors that. Uh, play a role uh, and L is the length of the tube, R is the radius, uh, the more there is the viscosity of the medium. So there is a relationship between pressure and flow, that's for sure, but the relationship is not linear. So blood pressure does not equal cardiac output and does not equal flow. Those are three different uh, concepts and we have to be on the same page when we talk about blood pressure, cardiac output and, and, and blood flow. Okay. The reason I, I'm talking about all this is that because in reality what we really care about uh, as clinicians is that we want to deliver oxygen to our cells uh, because this is how life works. We have uh, a blood uh, stream, we have capillaries, we have oxygen that is carried into our blood and we want to deliver the oxygen from the capillaries to the cells so that the, uh, the cells can utilize the oxygen and generate energy and they release uh, CO2 in the process. So um, it's important that, you know, our goal should be uh, delivering oxygen to the cells, to the mitochondria, and not really focusing just on the blood pressure. So that is why we uh, introduced the concept of oxygen delivery in physiology, uh, 
and uh, that's why we like to think in terms of oxygen delivery rather in terms of blood pressure and blood flow and oxygen delivery again here that's another uh, basic equation in physiology oxygen delivery is given by the cardiac output multiplied by the arterial content of oxygen so what that means is that the oxygen delivered to the cells is given by um, the amount of oxygen that is dissolved in the arteries that is pumped into the system so if we want to deliver, deliver oxygen we want to take the oxygen from the air absorb it through the lungs into our arterial blood and pump it around uh, with uh, through through the system with our cardiac output and if you look at the details of the equation then the cardiac output again is the stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate and all multiplied by the arterial content of oxygen and arterial content of oxygen is the oxygen that is dissolved in the plasma and that's the the um, the, the PaO2 multiplied by 0 0.0225 uh, and that's where we're talking about kilopascals um, so the oxygen that is dissolved in the blood is partially dissolved in the plasma but that's a very small amount and the majority of it is actually carried by hemoglobin so the oxygen delivery here is given by the uh, cardiac output multiplied by the oxygen that is carried by hemoglobin plus the oxygen that is dissolved in the plasma so if we want to optimize the oxygen delivery to our cells we're gonna to have to optimize the heart we're gonna to have to optimize hemoglobin level and we're gonna to have to optimize the lungs and oxygenation and that's what we do in intensive care unit that's what we do in intensive care unit all the time we support the heart we support the lungs and sometimes we transfuse patients and that's the core principle of uh, human applied physiology in intensive care unit now the problem with that equation is that does not account for the state of the capillaries in a system in in the body and when you have someone with a sepsis or a septic shock what you would see uh, at the capillary level uh, you would see a disruption of the capillaries and the microcirculation so in a normal subject you'd have a very dense uh, network of capillaries and the diffusion of oxygen is, is very smooth and it happens uh, uh, to all the cells whereas in your uh, septic shock patient you have disruption in the capillaries um, and then uh, your diffusion of oxygen is impaired so even though you're uh, you're optimizing the heart you're optimizing the hemoglobin and you're optimizing your lungs and even though you're doing all that uh, you would still see some degree of uh, ischemia in people with septic shock and that's because you have a capillary disruption so why does that happen? Uh, so now we can focus on the pathophysiology of sepsis and septic shock. Now that we have agreed on basic principles, uh, now we can discuss why all that happens. Why do we have a disruption in the capillaries in someone with a sepsis uh, or a septic shock? So first, uh, you have something called a dysregulated immune response. So here, uh, when the organism uh, encounters uh, molecules that are called uh, pathogen-associated molecular patterns or damage-associated molecular patterns, uh, the body reacts to these patterns. So basically what happens here is that you, if you have an infection with a microorganism that is releasing, you know, some uh, chemicals or even, you know, portion of its uh, its wall or whatever, uh, then the, the, the body uh, recognizes these molecular patterns. And same goes when you have a trauma, a tissue trauma or in a big injury. Uh, it does release some degree of, um, you know, um, molecular patterns that are recog recognized by our body and, and are recognized specifically by the immune response, uh, innate immune system. So we have an activation of our in, uh, innate immune system and by that we have basically an activation of our leukocytes so the white blood cells and so you have your macrophage uh, your your, your uh, neutrophils your uh, eos eosinophils and the mast cells and the dendritic cells uh, you have an activation of all those cells of the white blood cells and then you have a massive release of chemicals there uh, you have a massive release of chemicals and uh, and other substances um, that uh, really generate uh, um, uh, you can imagine it as a soup of chemicals that travels around the system 
and, and here you can see, you know, proteolytic enzymes, peptides, cytokines, reactive oxygen species, all of that gets released by those cells and all of that gets released into the system, into the uh, bloodstream and goes around and does damage. You have to imagine this as an acidic soup that is released by those cells that are reacting to those uh, molecular patterns uh, that are re either released by bacteria or whatever, you know, microorganisms or by tissue damage. So this uh, acidic soup uh, travels around the bloodstream and goes into the capillaries and, and creates damage and creates damage specifically at the level of the endothelium of capillaries. And here at the endothelium, um, you have this structure that is called glycocalyx uh, that usually protects the endothelium uh, from, you know, uh, from exposure. So when you have uh, the release of these chemicals, you'd have disruption of the glycocalyx and damage of the structure. And then you have exposure to the endothelial uh, cell, uh, to the uh, internal lumen of the capillaries and to, to these actual substances that are damaging um, the endothelium itself. So what happens is that uh, on one side you might have some degree of microthrombosis. Um, so the, basically the red blood cells stick to the uh, endothelial wall that is uh, exposed now because the glycocalyx is gone. And on the other um, side you might have some increased permeability of, of the capillaries because again the endothelium is exposed, is exposed to these substances and it gets damaged. So you'd have a capillary leak of, uh, of water. So in this case, um, in, in both cases, uh, either with microthrombosis of or increased permeability of the capillaries, you have a problem with oxygen diffusion because uh, with microthrombosis, of course, there is no flow in the capillaries, the flow is stopped. Uh, whereas in the increased permeability, uh, you, have, um, you have water that leaks out of capillaries and, and it sits into the interstitial space. So it sits between the capillaries and the actual cells. So you can imagine that the water that leaks out the capillaries increases the distance between the capillaries and the cells because you're increasing um, the volume of water in the interstitial space. And then you, have, you end up with a problem of diffusion. So diffusion of oxygen between the capillaries and the actual mitochondria. Uh, so you have a problem with affinity of oxygen and gradient of oxygen, the gradient of oxygen. You have a problem with the velocity or, or homogeneity of the flow. And you have a problem again with the density and the distance of, of the capillaries uh, between the capillaries and the cells. And uh, you see both these conditions at the same time. You see microthrombosis and increased permeability. Uh, so this is what happens at the capillary level in someone who is responding uh, in a in a um, in a dysregulated manner. So the third element that we see in sepsis and septic shock is mitochondrial. Uh, sorry, is cellular alterations, and you see those at the level of the mitochondria. Um, in terms of you know um, disrupted pathways in the mitochondria that leads to decreased uh, um, production of energy, uh, increased release of you know reactive uh, reactive oxygen species, uh, increased ap apoptosis of the mitochondria, uh, you know, and increased release of of more uh, damaging molecules. And then you also see some uh, cell death, death pathways activated. And those are activated really by the interaction of some cytokines or chemicals um, with the actual genetic codes of the cells that leads to the necrosis, apoptosis, and autophagy. So you'd have, you'd have uh, cellular death, mitochondrial dysfunction. So overall, you'd have uh, cellular alterations due to, re to the release of those uh, chemicals. So... So overall, you have these three uh, pillars of, of uh, sepsis and septic shock. You have, uh, again, dysregulated immune response to, uh, to uh, uh, stimulus. You have endothelial dysfunction and you have cellular alterations. All of those lead to a problem in the capillary uh, site. You have a problem at the capillary level, at the mi microvascular level, and therefore, even though you have optimized your heart, your lungs, and your hemoglobin levels, or your, your, you, you have tried to optimize your oxygen delivery, and you might have optimized your blood pressure and everything, you might still have a degree of organ failure because you're not able to diffuse oxygen to the cells.
uh, as we discussed before. So basically, uh, if the process uh, pr progress, you end up with something called multiple organ failure or dysfunction. Uh, so again, uh, as we said, uh, you have sepsis, you have septic shock, you have uh, dysregulated immune response and all that we discussed before. Uh, you have uh, impaired diffusion of oxygen to the cells from the capillaries. And then you start seeing the tissues, so the, the cells start to suffer, and in turn the tissues start, start to suffer, and then the organs start to suffer. So at some stage you start seeing a uh, uh, dysfunction of the organs, and by organs we, we mean really all the organs in the body, um, from the heart to the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, everything, the bowels even, and the brain. Uh, all of, of all the organs get a degree of dysfunction uh, by the release of all these chemicals and then the impairment of oxygen diffusion so that's why when we talk about sepsis we define sepsis as you know a dysregulated immune response that leads to one or more organ dysfunction and then if the dysfunction is uh, progresses then it, it, it becomes a failure uh, it does not return to baseline and it becomes an organ failure and when the organ failure is is really the cardiovascular system, and then you have you know a circulatory shock, then in that at that stage we we call it a septic shock. So how do we recognize someone who has a sepsis or sepsis, septic shock at the bedside? So as we said before, you know uh, sepsis, you have to have a suspicion of an infection going on there uh, or a big injury. Um, and then you would have uh, the emergence of a degree of organ dysfunction and you do that, you, you realize that by, you know, doing your labs and your blood tests and everything. Uh, and then you realize that there is an organ dysfunction going on and then you have your suspicion of an infection or a trauma and then you can say, yes, okay, there is a, a sepsis going on here and then we start treating as we will see shortly. Um, if the patient is becoming uh, hypotensive and is becoming, you know, uh, and is showing signs of, of organ uh, hypoperfusion, then uh, the uh, problem would become uh, evolving into a septic shock. But at the bedside, really, you don't really see any of that. I mean, at the bedside, when you see a patient uh, and you encounter the patient for the first time, the patient won't tell you that he or she are in shock or in sept or in sorry in septic in septic shock. Uh, you might go there um, because the patient uh, is having uh, an infection, and uh, if you catch the lab results that tell you that there is an organ dysfunction, then yes, you can have a. Uh, a conversation around sepsis, possible sepsis, but usually you are called uh, at the bedside because you know you have a degree of hypotension, even though it's not always present. But that's uh, uh, most often the, the the typical presentation of someone with a septic shock. So you go there, you go at the bedside, you have in the back of your head uh, a suspicion of an infection. Uh, you might have thought of that before, or you might uh, know about that, or a big injury. Um, and then the patient is uh, showing a degree of hypotension, maybe, uh, you know, um, hyper or hypothermia, um, very high or very low white blood cells. Um, and then again, some degree of tachycardia, perhaps. So you go there at the bedside and you want to assess if the patient is going into a septic shock. So if you are suspecting a septic shock, you have to uh, analyze the perfusion of the organs uh, because that is what shock means. Uh, so, uh, so inadequate cellular uh, oxygen, uh, sorry, utilization of oxygen. So in this case, usually it's it's uh, discussed as hypoperfusion of the organs. And how to assess the hypoperfusion of organs at the bedside? is by observing uh, three uh, clinical windows and those are the brain, the kidney and the skin. So because a kidney uh, that is poorly perfused does not filter very well and you would see someone with a shock that uh, they do not urinate normally, uh, so they do not urinate as much. So you have a degree of oliguria in someone who's, a, who's showing a shock, any kind of shock, but we're talking about septic shock now. So if you look at the, at the urinary output, they have a degree of oliguria, 
if you look at their brain, so at their, you know, mentation, they show a degree of altered mentation. They're not in coma, but they might be agitated or confused um, because, you know, a brain that is poorly perfused, again, uh, doesn't think very well. So you have the brain, you have the patient is confused, is agitated, is oliguric, and their skin is mottled, uh, mottled and, and clammy. So those are the three clinical windows that you can observe at the bedside. And uh, from here, you might want to take an arterial uh, sample and you just to assess the lactate level. And if the lactate is above uh, two milli equivalents per liter, then you're talking about uh, circulatory shock. And then if you have a suspicion of an infection going on there, then you're talking about a suspicion of septic shock. Okay, so at the bedside, you're called because the patient is uh, not feeling well, you have a suspicion of an infection, and um, you observe the organ perfusion if you're suspecting a septic shock. If you're just suspecting a sepsis, then uh, it's just a matter of or, uh, assessing the organ uh, functions. So how to assess at the bedside again, uh, just to wrap it up. So you're called because have uh, usually have an, a degree of arterial hypotension. And then th the first step to do at the bedside is to assess the uh, signs of tissue hypoperfusion clinically. And as we said before, is the brain, the kidneys, and the skin. It's only those three clinical windows. So the brain, the kidneys, and the skin. And if those signs of hypoperfusion are absent, then we're probably talking about some degree of hypotension uh, chronically. If the tissues of hypoperfusion are present, um, then you want to take a measurement of blood lactate. And if the blood lactate comes back as normal, then again, it's probably uh, too early or it's just a chronic hypotension. Uh, but if uh, the blood lactate is above 2 milliequivalent per liter, uh, then we're talking about circulatory shock. And in the context of, a, of an infection, or a big injury, then we're talking about um, about septic shock. And here, we're gonna have to start treating immediately. And we, we, uh, we use an approach that is called uh, early goal-directed therapy. So I'm not gonna go into the literature of that, but early goal-directed therapy means that if you encounter someone with a septic shock, or any shock for the matter, but in this case, in septic shock, you're gonna have to treat early and aggressively you have to try you have to treat early and aggressively why because uh, sepsis and septic shock uh, is a condition that has a high mortality we're talking 15 percent to 35 percent of patients who have this uh, condition uh, they will die uh, in even in the best centers uh, it is a medical emergency in the United States, each year, you know, uh, nearly 250,000 people die of, uh, of sepsis and septic shock. So we're talking a death every two minutes. And that is more than the uh, deaths from uh, prostate cancer, breast cancer, and AIDS combined. As we said, one uh, every five patients die, even with the best available therapy. And importantly, the mortality increases 8% every hour that the treatment is delayed. So let that sink in. You have a mortality that increases by 8% every hour that the treatment is delayed. So this concept is not new, actually. Uh, you can see it here from um, Niccolo Machiavelli's uh, book, The Prince, uh, in which he wrote that hectic fever at its inception is difficult to recognize but easy to treat. Left unattended, is it becomes easy to recognize and difficult to treat. And that's at the 1500s. Uh, today is exactly the same. Nothing has changed. Those are the surviving sepsis campaigns, so those, the international guidelines for the management of sepsis and septic shock. And the very first uh, statement they make uh, for uh, the initial management of, of sepsis and septic shock is the following. Sepsis and septic shock are medical emergencies and we recommend that treatment and resuscitation begin immediately. So those statements come from studies uh, like um, the one we're showing here, 2006 study from Kumar, uh, where uh, they showed that uh, every the, every hour of delay um, of antimicrobial anti uh, therapy in patients with septic shock 
uh, correlates, it's associated with a measurable and proportional degree of uh, mortality. Every hour of delay of treatment with antibiotics in someone with septic, septic, sorry, with septic shock, it is associated with a proportional degree uh, increase in mortality. So that was re uh, real um, for septic shock, but it's also real for sepsis without uh, circulatory shock. Uh, in this study, again, uh, delays in antimicrobial administration in people with sepsis and not septic shock are also correlated with an increased mortality. So the core message here at, is that do not delay management of patients with sepsis or septic shock. So what is the management? Uh, I will just I will just going to make it very simple here. Management of people with sepsis and septic shock, you're gonna have to take three things from the patient, and those three things are blood cultures, lactate measurement, and urine output measurement. So you take those three measurements from the patients, and you give three. Uh, therapies you give oxygen you give antibiotics and you give fluids plus minus vasopressors so let's discuss this um, the reason we take blood cultures is because we want to make a diagnosis of him of bacteremia so when you have someone with a sepsis or a septic shock you want to have to uh, you want to have to take blood cultures uh, so that you can uh, measure uh, the presence of um, bacteria or other microorganisms before you give antibiotics. Then you want to take a measurement of lactate to assess the degree of uh, hypoperfusion. And you want to measure the urine output hourly also to assess or to monitor uh, the perfusion of the kidneys. So you take these three measurements and at the same time, or shortly after that, uh, you uh, give you you start giving uh, oxygen. You start giving uh, um, antibiotics, a large spectrum antibiotics, and you start giving fluids and or vasopressors. So oxygen uh, again, as we said before, you want to increase the oxygen delivery to your to your system. So you want one way to do it is to increase the concentration of oxygen in your bloodstream, and to do that, you just increase the oxygen that you're giving to your to your patients. So you get the patients to breathe more oxygen, so to be able to deliver more oxygen to the cells. So you give large spectrum and broad spectrum uh, spectrum antibiotics because you don't know what you're treating, but you're just gonna be uh, very broad in your management. Empirical treatment, it's called, and then you want to give uh, fluids. And uh, typically, uh, it is recommended to give uh, 30 milliliters per kilogram of fluid of crystalloids um, to uh, counteract the effect of hypoperfusion. And at the same time, if that bolus of fluid is not enough, you can start uh, vasopressors at the same time that you're giving fluids. And by vasopressors, usually uh, we give noradrenaline or phenylephrine. Uh, on the wards so simple things but really effective so you take three blood blood cultures lactate and urine output measurements and you start at the same time you start with your oxygen uh, supplementation your broad spectrum antibiotics and your fluid uh, plus minus vasopressors and you have to do that uh, within the first hour that is critical as we said Mortality increases every eight uh, eight percent every hour. There is a measurable and proportional increase in mortality by uh, by um, an increased uh, in delay. So you have to start doing these things within the first hour that you recognize a sepsis or a septic shock. So to uh, reiterate. Whenever you make a diagnosis of sepsis or septic shock at the bedside, you immediately have to start thinking of management. And you, so you take those three things and you start giving these other three things. Uh, 
uh, within the first hour. Now, that does not mean that the fluids and the antibiotics uh, have to go in within the first hour, but you have to start them within the first hour of your clinical diagnosis. So that's all, and thank you very much.